So I realize I'm between you and the, the reception, and, uh, and it's a little bit long, but I'll try and get through this. Um, so the vector extension, um, I thought it'd be good to go over this. We talked about this a few times. I'll talk about the prehistory. Um, when we started RISC-5, it was actually to do vector-based research, and the V was a kind of a pun on vectors. Um, and at Berkeley, we built this thing called Huacha, which was a research vehicle, um, and we taped that out many, many times. Um, there's an explicitly decoupled vector fetching slider with its own vector instruction stream, and for the RISC-5V extension, we want something that's more traditional, a single instruction stream a la Cray style vectors. And anyway, this is kind of where vectors came from. Uh, the goals for this extension, I think I took this slide from a 2015 presentation, um, has to be efficient and scalable for lots of design points from low cost, high performance, in order, decoupled, out of order, and cover a lot of data types, um, good compiler target, support both auto vectorization style compilation and explicit SPIMD style programming models, and work with OSs and everything else, virtualization layers. Um, the other requirement everybody had was it had to fit in the standard fixed 32-bit encoding space. Um, um, and be a base for future extensions. Um, so the first proposal was at the June 2015 workshop. We've had many, 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 many iterations. It's evolved, it's become a saga. Um, you thought Game of Thrones went on for too long. This thing's gone on for uh, many years now. But uh, this beginning of this year, we finally had a stable draft that I think uh, folded in everybody's desires uh, as much as we could. Um, so that P point seven draft came out in January. Um, and um, one thing I realize is this is by far the largest RISC V extension. It's bigger than everything else put together, um, which is why it's taken so long, partly. Um, so now we have this, the version, it's actually 0 0.7.1, um, is now available um, with the specs there, and there's matching bin utils and spike for this thing now available as of this week, as of this week um, for people to go work on. The idea is to spend about a year playing with this and working on it in the compilers and software tool chains. Um, before trying to freeze it. Um, so what's it based on? There's 32 extra vector registers that are added to the state, plus a few uh, um, CSRs here. Um, so the vector registers, 32 of them. The length of them is implementation dependent. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, there are a few vector registers, V type, that sets the type of and width of the elements. A classic vector length register that sets how many you operate on. And a V start, which is used to resume after a trap. So you can partially execute a vector instruction and resume, um, and then there's a few extra bits that are shoved in the existing floating point control and status register. Um, so to make it work across a range of designs, there's a few parameters. There's ELAN is the largest single element you can operate on, so typically, say, 32 bits or 64 bits. Um, VLAN is how many bits there are on each vector register. Um, SLAN is this parameter, which we call the striping distance, and this is used to control trade-off between wiring and spatial locality in the memory system, um, and usually you would set that to the width of your memory port. Um, and the goal of the vector I say is to let you run the same binary code, even with different variations in VLAN and SLAN, uh, different implementations. So the goal of SLAN is to give implementers um, freedom to build things the more efficient way they can. Um, same with that VLAN, but the binary encoding is supposed to work across all the different machines, provided you follow a few very simple rules in writing the code. So now when we talk about design points, this follows on the earlier discussion, we want to cover a wide range of design points with vectors. So like the, um, the, the P extension that was just presented, that's really meant for very small cores just using the existing register state. Um, the, the V extension is for much larger, can be for much larger data parallel engines. So the low end, you have 32 registers of 32 bits. This is kind of the minimum possible configuration. Um, but this large one represents, um, uh, this matches like the current high-end uh, HPC SX uh, processor um, as um, uh, something like 64 kilobytes of vector register file. That's the high-end, and that's the current existing core that somebody has built with a different ISA. We want to cover that whole space of uh, ISAs. And also, a big deal is in-order versus out-of-order um, core designs and cores that have mostly spatial execution, so all the vector happens in one clock cycle. Some of them have deep temporal execution. The vector executes over multiple clock cycles. So quite a range of design points. So it's just to put your, just think about the, the challenges. How do you cover this whole space? That's what we've been trying to figure out. And one of the big design challenges is opcode space. Um, this community does not, you know, doesn't really understand you know, Shannon theory. And, you know, we're not building this thing with qubits. We're using regular binary bits. And so everything has to fit in 32 bits, but 
there's too many operations to do that. Um, uh, the desire to stay within 32-bit encoding was low-end systems usually only have a 32-bit instruction fetch. Um, people didn't want to go to mixed-length instruction streams. Um, and static code size also matters on embedded platforms. Um, um, but everybody wanted the, the set of data types and everything people wanted to support kind of kept growing. And so the solution was to split out um, into a V-type register, which encodes. You can view this as holding some part of the instruction encoding um, that you set before you use the main operation. Um, so there's uh, six or seven extra state bits in there. Um, what's encoded in here is the width of the elements, 8-bit, um, 16-bit, 32-bit, and there's room for up to one kilobit elements. Um, second one is called this vector length multiplier, which lets you group multiple vector registers into what we call a vector register group to give you effectively longer vectors, and that's also used for mixed precision. And then finally, there's this EDIV concept of dividing an element into sub-elements, which is useful for some um, pseudo-2D operations. Um, as a result of this, we managed to pack the encoding into only one and a half major opcodes. It basically uses half of the um, floating point load store space um, and then um, also uses a whole new major opcode for the arithmetic operations. So it's quite dense. Um, now, one thing to think about, we actually view this as a, a 32-bit encoding is really a compressed form of the full 64-bit encoding, which we should be defining as well. Um, and that 64-bit encoding will allow you to do everything in one go without having to set a register first. Um, so vector length control. Um, the current maximum vector length is given by how many bits you have in the vector register divided by how wide each element is. So VLAN divided by standard element width, that tells you how many elements maximum there are in the register. So if you have a 512-bit register, 32-bit elements, then VL max is 16. Um, so that's the maximum number you can do in one instruction, but then there's a vector length register that sets how many you actually do when you do an instruction. So VL is set between zero and um, VL max. So that's a separate CSR. Now to set all these parameters as a single instruction ve vector set vector length as immediate and register form, the immediate one is the one people will usually use. And so this takes a um, one register argument, which is the application vector length. This is how many elements I want to do. Um, the immediate sets these parameters that is in V-type. And then it writes a register that says how many you, you got to do. So that's the setting of the vector length register. So basically this instruction sets the vector length register to the minimum of what you asked for and what is possible with the current hardware setting. Right? And so to give you a little example how this works, this is a mem copy. So um, um, first instruction, just saving the destination. Um, and the VSET VL here is saying, do 8-bit elements. Um, I need to do N of them, where N was the size of the mem copy. And then T0, the scalar register, is going to be written with the value that was also written to VL that says, how many bytes did I get to copy this time? And then do a vector load byte into vector register 0. I bump the pointer, the address pointer here, the source pointer by the value T0, which is how many bytes I did this time. Um, I also decrement the count of how many I did by T0. And then I store back the byte vector. V0 gets stored back to memory at the destination. And then I bump the destination pointer. And I see, is there any elements left to do? If there is, I go back and do more. And if not, I return. And that's the whole mem copy. Right? So that's going to just copy with four vector of register lengths um, in, a, in a loop. Um, and it'll run the same way regardless if your vector length is 32-bit or um, 4 kilobit in each vector register. The assembly code, the binary code will be the same uh, on different machines. All right, so that's the model. So mapping elements to vector state, um, it's very simple. One of the things that's changed in the last few iterations is making the registers very explicit and the state encoding in there very explicit. Um, this is kind of the obvious thing. If I have 256 bits, I can divide into 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit elements, and they just numbered contiguously from the lowest bit to the, the highest bit. So that's the obvious mapping. In the case that you're using what we say LMULD equals one, which means one vector register at a time is being used in the instructions. Now, now let's talk about some of the more complicated things that show up. Mixed precision. So um, these days there's a lot of interest in mixed precision, uh, saving bits, compressed representations, things with AI, machine learning, also classical DSP benefits from all this. 
Um, so they need to do things like operate on 16-bit and 32-bit values in the same operation. Um, uh, in the vector ISA, there's a whole bunch of operations that are sort of go up and down by a factor of two. So for example, I multiply two n-bit numbers, I get a 2n-bit uh, result. Um, the problem there is you need, if you want to have all the elements line up and you want to have the vector length be the same, you need more bits in one of those cases. And um, some other ISAs do this by requiring you execute multiple instructions um, and do even and odd or do upper and lower halves of the register. Um, but instead of doing that, what we do is use ELMO um, to uh, effective ELMO multiplier so that you pair multiple vector registers together to pick a bigger group. So, um, so now you have the vector length maximum is not just vector length times this SCW, but multiplied by ELMO. So you can have up to eight vector registers that operate as a single vector register group um, when you use uh, a large ELMO. So now you have this sort of setting where, say I'm doing a vec say I'm doing mixed precision code that's doing 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, and 64-bit stuff all in the same loop, all mixed together as an extreme case. Um, well, that all works quite nicely where you have vector length max is 32 in each of these configurations. So basically, if the element width divided by L mole is a constant, then you can um, do instructions that mix widths uh, across them and everything lines up. Now, where SLAN comes in, that striping parameter I talked about before, the problem is if, say, my elements were set up such a way that I was doing an operation with byte zero and you know word zero, that's fine. They're sort of next to each other. If you view this as the data path, but something with byte 9 and element 9, it may end up somewhere over here unless you take account of this striping length. The striping length is basically you move all the elements, you keep all the elements contained within this striping length until you've visited all the element numbers, then you go to the next one. And what this means is, uh, for example, element 0 through f, if they're bytes, or if they're half words, or if they're words, or if they're double words, they all live in the same piece of the data path. So that SLAN gives you... Uh, uh, this wiring span. What's the furthest distance I have to wire across the data path to get mixed precision things to connect to each other? Um, it also um, kind of gives you the width of elements I'll write to the write port in the reg file when I'm doing unit stride loads from memory. So this SLAN is an implementation parameter. You pick one that's convenient for you. And as long as you write your code in a way that you never use vector register values with different ELMOs, uh, software doesn't care about it. So there's a lot of vector... Um, uh, instructions, um, the very basic types, there's integer and floating point operations, vector vector, vector scalar, where the scalar comes from the X register or an F register, if it's a floating point operation. Um, there's also vector immediate for integer operations. Um, so there are these widening operations that take two things of one element width and give something of twice the width, and we're also looking at four times the width, and narrowing that take a twice wide one and narrow it down to single widths. For example, when you have an accumulator, a fixed point accumulator, you often want at the end reduce it down to a, a single width value. Um, so load and stores, unit stride, stride it indexed. Um, and the element sizes they move are either, um, they can be a fixed 8-bit, 16-bit, or 32-bit value that puts, ends up in the least significant bits of the element, or they can be an SEW sized element, so an arbitrarily sized element that fits into the, the current size. The other thing we support is segments for loads and stores. Segments are like loading structures into multiple vector registers. Um, so you should have seen this in other ISAs. So a vector load say of three. Say in memory you have packed 8-bit RGB values. You can load those into three different vector registers. So you kind of do a corner turn between the um, array of structures here into um, a set of separate uh, vector registers. So load into vector four, starting here, segments then three. I'm actually writing vector registers four, five, and six with those different values. Then it's easy to operate on those structs using regular vector instructions. Predication is supporting in this very tight 32-bit encoding. There's only one bit for a predication that basically means either unmasked or always masked with vector register zero. Um, now, some of the big debates in the group are about um, what happens to masked off elements or elements past the end of the L. Um, because you want to do kind of precisely different things for in-order and out-of-order designs. Um, an out-of-order design with renaming um, always allocates a new destination register for every result. And so if you say that the elements are undisturbed, that means you have to copy the old element from the old physical register into the new physical register, which kind of implies you need an extra read port. 
on those. Um, but in order design, if you say that you zero those values, that means you have to explicitly build some microarchitectural gadgetry in the older machine to make those values appear zero. Otherwise, you have to go actually write them all. Um, so this is a, a fundamental conflict. Um, so a solution was to make both parties unhappy uh, for now. Um, this is something that still, I think we'll still be revisiting in the group. So uh, for now, the status is, this is the status. We'll try this out. We're going to do compiler work either way to see where we fall on this. Um, um, but one thing is, um, we want to make sure that all implementations do the same thing. We could have said, it's okay to either zero or leave it undisturbed. But the problem is software, there's cases where you want to do it one way or the other, and people will exploit it on an implementation if you let them. And so this would just cause incompatibility. So you end up with a, a split. So we decided to um, you know, pay some microarchitectural pain and say that destination elements past the vector length are zeroed, um, but masked off elements inside the vector length are preserved. Um, part of the reason here is that the, preserving the values actually um, is better for software usually because it reduces vector, vector register pressure. You can keep multiple different control flow paths, the values um, in the same set of vector registers rather than having to have unique vector registers. So you reduce vector spill code. Um, 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 so that's the, that's the trade-off. Now the other thing we did to help the out-of-order machines, the biggest read port count instructions are multiply adds, and we made those destructive which meant that you didn't actually need more read ports for the arithmetic operations in order to support renaming. Because uh, you will be reading the old value anyway because these are destructive mol adds. The only thing that hurts is uh, uh, on loads. Um, so I think this is something we're going to be revisiting um, um, over the course of the next um, few months, I think. Um, precise traps. Um, the model is that you, when you trap on a vector uh, instruction, uh, you resume at a, an element position, so it's precise to the element within an instruction. And this is to remove the need to, if you had required the instruction was restarted from the beginning, um, a scatter gather would need like hundreds of elements in the TLB to ensure it could complete. So to make sure you can complete, we have a progress, you go forward and um, complete. Um, so we did is this idea of dividing elements into one, two, four, eight um, sub-elements. This gets us uh, pr primitive form of 2D operations and lets us support very narrow sub-elements. Um, there's a bunch of other features, fault on first for vectorizing while loops, reductions, compression, I don't have time to go into all this. So the status though is the software is now up available, so the source code, Binutils, is out with the vector instructions in, Spike is now, the source code is out there, um, and Imperus also did a binary release of their simulator, so there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, we made a lot of progress over the last bunch of time. I just want to say a lot of people contributed to the design. Thanks. Thank you, Christian.